You're listening to Precinct 444, a podcast network from the National Law Enforcement Museum. Today we're bringing you an episode from Lifeline, offering a holistic wellness approach focused on supporting American law enforcement, promoting resilience, safety, and survivability. Welcome back to another Lifeline episode. Today we're taking a look back at the live webinar that took place on January 25th, which covered the NHTSA fourth quarter data review. Led by Nick Brule, Senior Projects Manager with our Officer Safety and Wellness team, he was joined by Rio Nelson, Traffic Safety Specialist of NHTSA, to discuss the most common traffic incidences and their circumstances. Nick also includes key points of safety for officers while on the roadways. Keep in mind, the Officer Safety and Wellness Department at the Memorial Fund houses free resources for officers and everyone else. For more information on those resources, please visit the episode description. And now for the NHTSA fourth quarter review on the latest law enforcement traffic-related fatality statistics. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, Welcome, everybody, to our fourth quarter webinar. Uh, As you know, if you've followed us along uh, with these um, regular webinars on law enforcement traffic safety, I try and bring us uh, a little bit of the National Law Enforcement Officers Museum uh, to the the background. So what you're looking at behind me is part of our real to real exhibit. So you have R-E-A-L to R-E-E-L, like the reel of a film. And we've got a number of sort of pop culture items from films and television um, and uh, law enforcement toys, which makes up the kind of fun exhibit behind me. Uh, Today, as always, uh, we're joined by Rio Nelson. Uh, Rio's a traffic safety specialist with the, um, let me get it right, because I always mix it up, Enforcement and Justice Services Division of NHTSA. Um, So I'd like to welcome uh, Rio and uh, get his um, input on where we are or what's going on. And, uh, and then I'll present on where we ended the year 2023. All right, thank you for the introduction, Nick. I don't have any updates uh, from NHTSA um, this fourth quarter, but um, the numbers for the estimate numbers for 2023 will be available shortly. And, and so once we <laughs> present, then I'll, I'll be able to update you with those. But uh, once again, I just wanna um, reaffirm that our graciousness for the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund and the things that you guys do, not only you, but your staff, um, to law enforcement, to the community in, in large. We just really appreciate the partnership that we have with you guys. And uh, we just hopefully continue, continue that, that graciousness. And that's all I have. All right. This until I'll just turn it over to you. I know we're short on time, so I'll just turn everything over to you. But thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we do have an excellent relationship with NHTSA. We have I've worked here at the Memorial Fund uh, since 2014, and uh, we've worked with the the folks at NHTSA since then, and we have a cooperative agreement, which uh, really um, supports the work and the research that we do. So I'm going to do a couple things today. Um, I want to do a quick brief review of some of the things we've done in the year, Um, and then I will go over the fourth quarter numbers, as well as the entire numbers for 2023 with some comparative analysis. And then I'm gonna present to you, um, and I may have mentioned it in the October webinar, I'm gonna review very briefly with you a a report or a paper, whatever you might wanna call it, on the use of tire deflation devices and share with you all what we found. And you know, really our mission here at the Memorial Fund, and you've heard me say it before, is to keep names off the wall. And this is why NHTSA partners with us is because we then go through all this fatality data, which is very difficult to do sometimes. You know, uh, sometimes sitting reading these reports that we get from the agencies are, you know, are tough reads. Um, And uh, but it's so important that we look at the data and find out what the trends are, look at what's preventable and package that so we can push it out to you guys to say, look, this is where cops are being injured and cops are dying. Here are the changes we can make um, and here's what's actionable. So, uh, uh, and then I wanna remind you, you can um, ask questions, put questions into the chat um, and Anna will forward those questions to me and I'll do my best to answer those questions if I can. Just a quick review. You know, here at the Memorial Fund every year, we add the names of the fallen. Um, and we honor those individuals by reading their names at the candlelight vigil. 
Uh, that occurs on every May 13th. And for the last seven or so years, it's occurred down on the National Mall. Um, you see that first image there is from our 2023 candlelight vigil. And, you know, this is a very uh, somber event, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a good event to attend to. There's a great deal and feeling of camaraderie. Um, as I said, it, it is a somber event, but it's well attended by all of the law enforcement leaders across the country. And there are normally tens of thousands of people lined up on the National Mall, as you can see in that image. Uh, I think I brought this up before, but I think it bears repeating. Um, we have sponsors from Whalen, the uh, Whalen Emergency Lights, and uh, they uh, outfitted a car uh, in a NASCAR, NASCAR car with not only our logo, the Memorial Fund logo on the hood, if you can see where my mouse is, but that back hood, which is actually referred to as a deck, has all the names of the line of duty deaths from 2023. And then in a little touch, and I brought this up, I think, last time of irony, there is a move over and slow down sticker on the rear bumper of that NASCAR race car. I think that's humorous. <laughs> maybe maybe folks don't think it's that funny. I think it's kind of interesting. The center image is just a reminder of these uh, traffic safety summits that we've been working with over the last couple of years. The group who put on the Lithincum Traffic Safety Summit along with us was the uh, Eastern uh, Transportation Coalition along with the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission and a number of other groups that all came together to share their safety initiatives and to share the important work done to make traffic safety for law enforcement and first responders. And that includes our DOT folks and our towing and recovery folks. There was great, there was some great information and representation from the towing, towing and recovery folks at that, um, at that summit. We have some plans for uh, future uh, messaging. Uh, we've met recently and discussed how to get a mass market message out to folks to better educate people about slow down and move over, avoiding distractions, driving safely. And we're planning for those messages to reach radio, television, social media, the whole gamut of communication. Um, and one of the things that came out of that uh, summit, and I've heard it since, and I don't know if other of you who are practitioners in traffic safety have heard this, but there's a tremendous misperception about what slow, slow down and move over really means. Many people have relayed to us that they simply thought it meant to yield the right of way to emergency vehicles, meaning those coming up behind you. And I'm not sure how people can misconstrue the two different messages, but apparently slow down and move over has been interpreted by a number of Americans. And as we know, the laws vary from state to state in terms of the requirements. Uh, but a number of people have the misperception that, that it is really referring to yielding the right of way uh, to emergency vehicles. So we're going to work to um, change that perception. And then the last image is just uh, one of our conferences. You know, we go to a lot of conferences across the United States. I'll be doing another conference this weekend in Ocean City, Maryland called Surviving the Stop. And uh, I'll be presenting on all of our traffic safety data in partnership with other organizations that are going to be putting on information about officers and seatbelts and uh, surviving uh, tactical, tactical elements of tra traffic stops. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is the museum. Here at the museum, we have podcasts that we regularly put on. We have exhibits that are rotating. Um, and we also have a number of events that deal with current issues in law enforcement. I think the next one we have that we're putting on is dealing with retirement in law enforcement. And for those of you who may be retired law enforcement, who are law enforcement liaisons or are doing something else uh, related to traffic safety, but are retired law enforcement officers, I know I had trouble transitioning uh, right out of the gate. I went into another job immediately, but there is a sense of loss and separation when you can never really go home again when you're not a member of the police department. And I know I'm not the only law enforcement officer who may, may feel that anxiety, but you also need to be prepared financially. So uh, one of the things the museum is putting on is a um, uh, an event that's going to have some professionals talk about that. So we just put out our end of year report. Um, the end of year report is available online on our website. We put out a report every year. This one just came out on January 11th. We still call it preliminary because there's still later cases and their details being submitted that need to be reviewed by the names committee. 
Um, and I may have explained that process before. It's an important part of our process here at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund um, as we go through evaluating whether or not a name can uh, be put on the wall if it meets our criteria. I mentioned the report. Uh, this report is, and I'm going to discuss this report. Uh, this this came out uh, in October, at late in late October, and it uh, it is also available. Uh, you can download it on our NHTSA page. It's a very brief report. Um, it's based on research that myself and Vanessa Venardo, uh, one of the research associates here at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund did, as we went back and did research on tire deflation devices and the fatalities that have been submitted to the Memorial Fund associated with the use of those devices. And I think by the end of this webinar, you'll understand why we need to take a look at these, these devices and how they're being used. Okay, so let's look at the numbers. Uh, 136 line of duty deaths for 2023. So that's a 39% reduction. Uh, firearms was a 25% reduction compared to the same period in 2022. Traffic-related fatalities also were down by 27% compared to 2022. One of the things I want to point out, and, and, and I think we've uh, talked about this in past webinars and also in other presentations that I've done, is historically, traffic-related fatalities outpaced gun-related fatalities. And now that has changed. And even though the numbers are going down, we're now having more officers shot than we are being killed in traffic-related incidents. So this is, a, this is a change historically. Back in 2016, 67 officers were shot and killed. And again in 2021, 67 officers shot and killed. Those outpaced our traffic-related incidents. And, and as you know, we have three major categories of traffic-related incidents, that being struck by, auto crashes, and motor, motorcycle crashes. And the last thing I'll cover here is you see the other causes is down. That's largely COVID, right? COVID is, uh, was a major driver in our numbers over the last few years, and they have been steadily declining. Um, but also encased within that other causes category are uh, less frequent um, cases of fell off horse, crush, electrocuted, fire, poisoned, those categories where law enforcement officers have died in the line of duty, but aren't in the big two categories of either traffic or firearms. So I hope that makes sense to folks. In our fourth quarter of 2023, you know, we, we break it all out. We had 11 fatalities from October through December uh, in that last quarter. That's two fewer than we had in the same quarter of 2022. We had five auto crashes, four struck buys, and two motorcycle crashes. And as we go through the numbers, I'll talk about a couple of cases that were a little different this year and were challenging us in terms of which bucket to put them in, to be quite frank. Um, we really do our best to make it so the um, incident is researchable under a heading category, but sometimes these incidents have multiple things going on in them. And uh, that's why when we started doing the TDD research, finding incidences of officers being struck while deploying TDDs, particularly older cases, wasn't necessarily as easy as it, as it is now. So here's where we are for 2023. This is a full breakout of all 37 of our cases. You see, we had 22 automobile crashes. Five of those were single vehicles. You know, we always look at the single vehicle crashes because by and large, those are preventable. Um, and I've, I've talked a lot about single vehicle crashes, and I think we're going to start doing some more in-depth research on those. Uh, struck by crashes, we've been focusing heavily on those. That number's lower than it's been in a long time, and it's actually, while we have a 10 up there, I'll explain it, it's actually, I'm going to say nine, <laughs> and I'll explain why I say that in a little bit. And then uh, five motorcycle crashes, three of which were single vehicles, and as we look at uh, 2023, I'll break out all of the incidences and the numbers on, on how each one of these crashes and struck bys broke out. So we always break it down also by agency type. You know, across the United States, it's estimated that there's 16,000 different law enforcement agencies within the country. That includes corrections, federal, tribal, state, local, sheriffs, municipal, county, et cetera. So we break it out into some larger categories, but as you see, this is how the line of duty death broke out in terms of traffic officer traffic fatalities for 2023. A couple of 
new things that were startling to me. There were three cases involving very young officers, not only young in age, but very young in experience. One officer had five days on the job and was in a patrol car and was in a crash. Another officer just had a very short time after having graduated from the academy and again was involved in a crash while in a marked police car by themselves. And in the other instance, we had a crash involving a recruit officer who, who was sworn and was with her FTO. They were involved in a crash. And I can tell you now, and it was in the news report about it, neither of them were wearing their seatbelt. Um, and that's something that you will always hear me harp on and something that needs to be addressed uh, when you've got a recruit in your car and you're the FTO or the senior officer and your officer, neither of you have your seatbelts on. So of the 2023 automobile crashes, um, here are the basic circumstances. In other words, what officers were doing at the time of these crashes. Um, five were responding as backup to requests for assistance from other officers. Four were responding to calls. And when I look at those, and I mentioned in our last webinar, and I think I had a question uh, in our second quarter webinar, I said they were expediting to the scene and someone said, well, what exactly does that mean? So the predominant number of these calls are lights and sirens. So I want people to know that, that it's not what we would call code two, it means directly to the scene as soon as possible. These were emergency response lights and siren. In some of the cases, as I go through them, it's difficult to tell uh, generally the nature of the call is the clue or there's it's noted in the report, you know, that they were, or you, cause we also ask for CAD reports. So in very often in dispatch notes, you can see that they were assigned priority. Uh, and then you had uh, three who were just on patrol, uh, five who were either coming and going, they had take home motors or uh, excuse me, they had take home cars uh, or they were on admin runs. They were conducting a follow-up investigation or headed to training or taking up another position for a correction detail. Don't forget, we have corrections officers uh, on the wall as well. One was involved in an, as an escort to a parade, uh, and then another was um, killed in a crash involving a pursuit. So we try and broaden the data here. Now, I've, I've been here for 10 years, and for the last few years, I've just been giving a like a five-year look. I, I really am now expanding it to a 10-year look. We can now give you a 12-year look of solid data of what's happening with automobile crashes. And this is the number of automobile crashes since 2012. So if we were to look at this up and down graph, you can see we had a high of 36. And this year is the lowest we've had in 12 years at 22 automobile crashes. And don't forget within that are single vehicle crashes, which is a sort of subcategory of automobile crashes. Um, so it seems like they've been sort of trending down a little bit and hopefully we continue that, that trend. Although last year we had a pretty high year at 31. So what kind of crashes were involved in these fatalities? We know what the officers were doing. What were the crashes like? So seven of the crashes involved intersections where vehicles were basically T-boned. Seven of the crashes were head-on crashes. Um, one of those, unfortunately, was uh, an officer who crossed a double yellow line and crashed into a car while responding to a call. One involved a rear-end crash. Um, one was a sort of stranger circumstance. I mentioned that um, an officer leaving a school couldn't see a swing arm bar gate. And as he was driving out of the driveway, the gate was slightly canted and the edge of the lower right window of his cruiser caught it. And it went right in across the passenger driver's compartment into the driver's side of the vehicle and pinned him against the, the wheel, uh, killing him. So that's, um, again, a very unusual circumstance. So we had one crash that was a merge crash. And then I mentioned our um, uh, single vehicle crashes and those were largely vehicles that lost control while expediting. So I'll always bring you the seatbelt analysis. And as I mentioned, we're still in January. We still have cases that uh, we haven't had a chance to review. As a matter of fact, I just looked up in the research uh, bin box and there are some cases that have come in that uh, need to be pulled out and reviewed. That 22% represents those cases that I have not been able to review. Uh, the ones I have, 43% of the officers involved in automobile collisions were not wearing their seatbelt. And I can tell you that number, 43%, is just going to go up. And I would remind you that when I did the 10-year 
analysis of seatbelt use across 10 years of auto crashes, it was 47, closer to 48% of the officers involved in fatal traffic crashes were not wearing their seatbelt. So the moto crashes, um, we had two uh, crashes involving officers responding to work. One was responding to an assignment. Um, within one of the, uh, it's actually a struck by, but I initially had categorized it as a moto. And that's another one of the cases I mentioned to you that we have to kind of look at which bucket to put it in. Uh, one of the motor officers was responding to work and uh, unfortunately rear-ended a car in front of him and that knocked him over off of his motorcycle only to be struck by another driver. And that is a case from Texas that is still open. It's an open hit and run of a motor officer uh, from uh, Texas. Uh, one officer who was on an ATV, and I told you I'm, I'm putting ATVs in the motorcycle category, uh, hit a pole. One officer was struck by a falling object. Uh, this happened down in Florida, a palm frond, a huge palm frond fell down off of a tree, one of those uh, palmetto trees and hit him, obscured his vision, and he went off the road and crashed into the median. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that was a fatal crash. Um, and then another officer was expediting to assist a fellow officer, and he lost control and struck a median barrier. So struck by crashes, and this leads us into our discussion of tire deflation devices. There were four tire deflation device related fatalities in 2023. That's very high for one year. I was already working on this report before the second case had even occurred and was very saddened to see. But by, by the time I had completed my report and we had started talking about it, we had a total of four tire deflation device related deaths. And just to be clear, these are, these are Matador spike strips. These are stop sticks. These are any brand name you can think of, of devices that are pushed out across the roadway to deflate the tires of suspect vehicles. Uh, one of our fatalities occurred in a construction site that was in Massachusetts. Um, and that, that brings to mind something that uh, we also saw this year. We saw a number of police vehicles being stolen and then leading agencies on pursuits in stolen police vehicles. Um, and this happened, I counted at least six this year from traffic stops to arrests to this case in Massachusetts, after this guy came in and crashed and killed uh, the police officer as well as some of the construction workers, he took off, was pursued, and ended up stealing one of the pursuing officer's patrol cars only to then crash that and be arrested. So I think we need to look at policy or training with regard to making sure that when you're doing some of these things that you shut the ignition off or lock the doors or do whatever we can do now um, so that we prevent suspects from finding their way into our patrol cars and giving them an opportunity to get away. Um, two were struck assisting motorists. One was trying to receive, retrieve an animal off the highway, and then two were intentionally struck. One of those who was intentionally struck was a parole officer, um, and this guy backed into her, I think, killing her as she was trying to place him under arrest for parole violation. So here's a five-year look at our struck by crashes. And if you remember in 2021, we really harped on struck by because of that intense increase between 2020 and 2021. Uh, the numbers, uh, it was a dramatic increase that year. Um, and we put a lot of energy into trying to message about it. That was the reason for our traffic safety summit in 2022. And here the numbers are going down. That does not make a trend. Um, you know, five years does not a trend make, but 10 years, I think we are really looking at something and can come up with some, some, some data and some information about what we're seeing. Um, this 10, which is actually, and I said, it's kind of a nine. Let me explain why I say that. We had a case um, that came to us where a retired law enforcement officer who is now a sworn officer working for the state government stopped at a crash scene to assist two vehicles that had wrecked. And the vehicle he approached was in the median and it was a median, and I don't know if you can see me in the thumbnail, but it was a median that was sloped down for drainage and the vehicle was facing up the median. So it's front end was facing towards the railway and it's rear was facing towards essentially the ditch. And this individual went to check on the driver and opened up the door. And at some point the ignition was turned off and I think the driver may have taken his foot off the brake 
the vehicle must have still been in drive, but rolled backwards and crushed that individual. So we're calling that a struck by because it involves a traffic crash. It is at a crash scene and it involves a vehicle running someone over. But in our traditional sense of struck bys, where you know officers are at crash scenes making traffic stops, directing traffic, engaged out there, you know, in the traffic, working the traffic, it's a little bit of an outrider. Um, but again, we're counting it. But I wanted you to know that in terms of the traditional struck by that I talk about all the time, this was a little bit of an outlier. It's a very tragic case. But in all of these cases, there are messages for us, right? So if 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 there's something to look at about how we're going to approach these vehicles when people are behind the wheel and still stunned, not thinking clearly, they're panicked, you go to help, make sure you don't put yourself in a bad position for a vehicle that could possibly rock and roll over someone. So you, you know our friends at the Emergency Safety Responder Institute, which is the Cumberland Valley Volunteer Fire Association uh, at respondersafety.com. They track struck buys. Uh, their numbers report 14 law enforcement. There's a reason for that. And I, I think I've explained it before, um, but for us, we, we capture only sworn certified law enforcement with law enforcement officers with full arrest powers. So sometimes for the folks at uh, um, uh, responder safety, they capture law enforcement for school crossing guards or auxiliaries or reserves who are out there assisting with traffic. Um, the number of struck buys that they calculated this year was 45. That's six fewer than last year. But as always, uh, our friends at Towing and Recovery are definitely bearing the brunt of this with 20 fatalities across the nation last year. Um, we've talked about our towing and recovery folks and their requests that came out of the summit was that we make sure that we as law enforcement and or if there's a blocking vehicle remain on the scene until the vehicles are hooked up and ready to go until the towing or wrecker service have gotten them off the roadway. I think that's really important and law enforcement may have a tendency to roll out once the report's done and the victims are off the scene and the fire board is left uh, and towing recovery pulls up and there we're like, yeah, okay, where are you taking it? Get the information and then we leave. We should stay on the scene to make sure they're safe too. So in 2023, I always try and go through and get which cases we can confirm, right, that we know involved impairment, distraction, whatever it may be, any of the D driver um, items that contributed to those crashes and contributed to those officers being killed. As of now, the number of impaired drivers that we confirmed was seven. One driver was distracted and one driver was drowsy. We did have three cases involving police officers who due to inattention or officer error uh, were involved in the uh, crashes and uh, one involved rear ending a tractor trailer at high speed, one involved a merge error. And I mentioned the other one I think already. And then we look at violations of slow down and move over. These are generally attached to struck by cases. Um, and of course, each state law is different as to what the requirements are. So as of this point, I could only identify four cases that I identified as involving a violation of slow down and move over. Okay, so let's talk about tire deflation devices. Um, these are the photographs of four individuals from 2023 who lost their lives um, while trying to bring a pursuit uh, to a safe end. And um, I want to just begin by saying that my reporting and my research and what I'm saying here is in no way intended to disparage any of these men or any officers who have died as a result of this action. Um, I would tell you we need to make changes in training. And I know that it is a risky behavior that uh, I think we need to take a look at. And clearly with four officers killed in one year, attempting to stop vehicles with these devices, these devices, we need to go back and look at what happened and understand so we can avoid it in the future. So we went back and this is part of the report that you can download online. Um, and it says risk versus reward is the title of the um, title of the report or white paper as you might want to call it. And we ended up looking at 17 fatal cases that were linked to the deployment of tire deflation devices. Um, in 15 of those cases, the officers were either completely exposed in the roadway or did not have adequate protection. And the upshot of this examination of these 10 years of cases 
is that officers are taking risks and in many cases unnecessary risks as they attempt to deflate the tires of suspect vehicles. And this image on the screen is one that might sort of accentuate some of the risks that officers have taken or are taking that I think we need to talk about and learn to avoid. The other thing I will point out is that in those 17 cases, three officers were struck and killed by other police officers. And that's, and that's even more devastating because you've had, now you have officers who are, are, you know, are trying to struggle with living with that in their lives and their career, having whether their fault or no fault or whatever it is, nobody wants to have to deal with that on top of uh, having an officer killed or having a situation where a suspect vehicle goes out of control and wrecks and we just, it compounds the problem. This is a snapshot I took from a YouTube video and I would encourage anyone who is sort of asking questions about what it is I'm saying. Um, a number of the things we reviewed came from YouTube, not just the 17 cases and all of the details, crash reports, CAD reports, photographs, autopsy reports and investigations that we reviewed for those 17 cases. We also went on YouTube to try and get a flavor for what was happening. Um, and we looked at the results of great stop stick deployments, the way it should be done, how effective they were. But we saw lots of videos of near misses and officers doing what this officer is doing right here running out up to the speeding vehicle to get the tire deflation devices or stop sticks directly under their wheels. And I will tell you, if you're not familiar with these things, they come with a tether. And that tether is designed for you to drag it across the road in front of the suspect vehicle, not run out and throw it in front of the car. And if you look at the YouTube videos time and time and time again, we see officers waiting by the side of the road to literally toss those things underneath a suspect vehicle tires that's not how the training manuals work. That's not how officers should be doing it. They need to have substantial protection and cover and use the tether. And if you have to put one on one side of the road and one on the other to drag them to make sure you don't miss the suspect vehicle and then quickly withdraw them from the roadway, that's the way to do it. And the other thing I would tell you is that a number of police vehicles also get spiked and a number of civilian vehicles get spiked because if you review some of the videos and some of the reports, the officers are leaving part of the, the, the used spike sticks in the roadway and jumping in their cruisers and joining the pursuit only to have a semi run over all the spikes and get all their tires deflated. And that, that ends up being paid for by the agency. And I don't wanna talk about cost right now. I wanna talk about lives and injuries. Uh, you can also see a number of injuries in these videos. Some of them are almost too terrible to watch um, but the upshot of all this is that the risks officers are taking to deploy these are uh, unnecessary and we need to find a better way to do it. We need to keep names off the wall. And again, I want to reiterate, I'm not here to disparage any of these officers or to dishonor what they were doing. They were doing their jobs and trying to terminate a pursuit and bring something to an end and apprehend a suspect. Um, but if we look at the totality of all these circumstances, there are patterns and we need to break some of these patterns. Uh, and as I mentioned, we went back through our old data and we discovered that around 1996 is when these uh, devices were really put into use in any large way. And a total, we found in our database, a, a total of 46 line of duty deaths connected, and that doesn't include the four from this year, connected to the use of tire deflation devices. Um, and then looking at the whole picture of the 10 years that we looked at, at those 17 fatalities, a total of 21 people die in those. So you have 17 plus four extraneous people who are killed in these crashes, one innocent and then, of course, suspects. Eight officers were also injured. Numerous vehicles were wrecked. And, and the speeds that were reported in either the CADs or in the reports of the suspect vehicles being chased the, the average was 93 miles an hour. Several of the cases were over 100 miles an hour. And again, manufacturers who put out their guidelines for these devices um, advise against using them at vehicles traveling at extreme rates of speed. And one can imagine why. If you deflate four tires on a vehicle going 400 miles an hour, you may in fact cause a fatal crash. Um, I, again, understand the necessity to bring the pursuit to a quick end, and these devices do work. They're very good for a number of things, and when used appropriately, I'm not here to disparage the use of them. I just want us to understand what the data is showing and what we're seeing when we analyze these cases. 
So I have a guardrail in this image because that really is one of the best things for officers to get behind or a bridge abutment um, or use the full 80 feet of tether that I think stop stick has as in the 40 feet of tether that the other manufacturer of these expandable spike strips have. That's to give you separation, to get you away from the highway. Um, one of the things that if you read the training manual for stop sick, it says under no circumstances shall an officer enter the roadway. And the other thing it says is vehicles are not substantial cover. And one of the more common things we saw that resulted when the, when the crash occurred as either the suspect intentionally rammed or moved to avoid the stop sticks and crashed into the police vehicles. And again, you can find video examples of this on YouTube. It knocked the vehicle into the officer who was basically using it as cover, killing that officer. And I would tell you that that's exactly what happened in the latest line of duty death um, in, I think it was the Dakotas where a deputy sheriff was putting out spike strips and the individual in the stolen vehicle slammed into the patrol car, knocking it into the deputy, killing him. So a vehicle is not substantial or adequate cover. So uh, you might want to preset locations along highways. So, I mean, pursuits happen a lot, particularly if you have multi multiple jurisdictions or you're a, a state police agency that can identify locations and mile markers where it's safe to quickly deploy. And think about deploying two sets with officers on opposite side so they can drag these things, spike the suspect tires, and then quickly remove them. And that's one of the other problems, communications. Communicating uh, clearly in a couple of the cases I re re analyzed, communication was not there. Pursuing officers did not know spike strips were being put out. Um, and there were different agencies involved in the pursuit. And I think some of those might have led to uh, officers striking other officers because they came in through the scene hot, not knowing that vehicles had stopped and that spike sp strips had been deployed and then tragedy ensued. I also recommend supervisors uh, be ones to approve deployments and that supervisors ensure their people are behind adequate cover or protection. And everyone should then understand what that means. And I think those guidelines that we've come up with are in comportment with what the uh, Police Executive Research Forum said when they issued their report about pursuits. They talk about pursuit termination techniques and they talk about tire deflation devices. And I think their recommendations are in line with what we've recommended as well. And again, I'm reminding everybody, our, the point behind this is to save lives and prevent injury. So um, as always, our key topics in traffic safety sort of remain the same. Seatbelts, um, as we've all heard, complacency kills. Fatigue is a huge issue. It could explain a number of our crashes uh, with officers who ran off the road. Tire deflation devices, I've covered that. Training, we need to improve our driver's training to ensure our officers are avoiding the distractions in the cars, are driving within the limits, um, and, and obeying policy. Uh, right side approaches. I don't know if anybody saw the video that just came out from Oklahoma. Oklahoma trooper, thank God he was making a right side approach. His vehicle got struck and it got knocked into him, um, but it knocked him off the road. But if he was on the left hand side, he would not be with us anymore. Uh, there's also a new uh, line of duty death case. We've had two this year. Uh, one unfortunately involved an officer being struck by another officer in a pursuit and killed down in Georgia. And then uh, just, I believe it was last night, uh, a Michigan state police officer was struck and killed by a drunk driver while he was out assisting a motorist. Um, and of course, that's a very common circumstances where impaired drivers are striking people on the roadway. And then of course, being seen. This is really important. Um, not only visibility vests, but marking your scenes appropriately so people can see where you are, what the traffic lane is, look at the lighting studies we've talked about, and make sure your vehicles have conspicuous markings on the rear of them. And uh, I've seen more and more cruisers that are white with subdued markings, and I wish someone would explain it to me. Yeah, they reflect at night, but I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I understand it. Um, it looks kind of strange when you see these, a white charger with barely visible police markings on them. Um, I guess it's, I'm not sure why. So maybe you can explain it to me. Uh, so I think that's it. If you have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, region four, unfortunately led our, led the way this year. There are 11 law enforcement fatalities from region four. Um, region four and six are usually our highest regions, that Sunbelt area down there. Um, but almost a third of our fatal crashes occurred down in the Sunbelt area down in region four in those five states. Uh, last reminder, 
struck bys, responder safety, um, go on their uh, website and there's this tab at the top that says uh, struck by or near miss to report these. We can't do anything without data. So if you're an LEL and not pushing this out, you need to push it out so people will report the injuries, the crashes without injury, as well as the near misses, so we can start getting more data on this. Uh, we've been doing that for over a year now, and hopefully it's garnering us some good information. So that's my information. Um, as you look at that and write that down, I'm going to check on our questions here. Um, well, first question is, does other the other category include uh, officers who died of heart attacks? It does. It includes strokes cardiac events that meet our criteria for that. And I said, that's a, that's a big category that often has some of our more um, unusual or um, uh, irregular cases that do occur from time to time. Um, but yes, heart attacks are included in that. Uh, is today's PowerPoint going to be available to viewers? Yes, and hopefully quicker than last PowerPoint when I had a little bit of a faux pas with my power or whatever it was. I can't remember. I, I always seem to do these things and have some sort of a technical glitch. But yes, we will put it on our website and it will be available under the NHTSA, um, NHTSA banner on our website. Uh, how can viewers get access to the tire deflation device report and preliminary line? Of OK, so those reports are available on our website, um, nlemf.org or lawmemorial.org. Uh, or if you want to write down my email, I will send you uh, a copy of it. It's a PDF, so you got to download it. Um, and uh, the so both of those uh, end of your reports, as well as my TDD uh, report, is there. Um, and I welcome any comments or concerns. One thing I would tell you is when I finished the TDD report, I was in um, San Diego at ICP, and I hand walked copies of it over to all of the vendors selling. Um, tire deflation devices. And a couple of them followed up with me, you know, and you often wonder, are they going to be mad at me or, or what do they think and all that kind of stuff. They were, they were fine with my report and understood where I was coming from. And uh, uh, again, so, and I would also caution, um, I, I'm not an academician, right? I'm a retired lieutenant who is going through this data and understanding what it is, but, you know, I'm not preparing um, plus or minus numbers and, and skews or whatever, all that kind of thing. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, it's a very simple report reporting the data that I've, I've gone through. Uh, are ghost cars a good idea in general? I assume this means white cruisers. You know, um, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know. And I think ghost cars is what I was just referring to. And I took a picture, picture of one in the jurisdiction where I live. And I went to talk to an officer who was in one one day. And I'll just simply say our interaction was not ideal. Um, and um, but his opinion was that all police cars should be unmarked. I completely disagree with that. Um, and uh, I guess maybe he meant the even the uh, traffic enforcement cars should be unmarked. I disagree with that. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know what the purpose of those are other than to be able to hide during the day. I don't know. And, and there could be a very good reason behind it. I just not sure I, I get it. For me, I'm the kind of guy and I'm a cop who's used to driving a marked take home. I drove a marked take home my whole, most of my career. And yeah, you got to make traffic stops on the way home. It's a burden, but you've got to, you know, uphold the law and uh, uh, wave your flag when something occurs in front of you. So um, I'm not sure what the problem is with having marked, marked, marked vehicles. Um, uh, someone is asking about teaching live. Uh, yeah, if you want to hit me on uh, uh, on a sidebar or send me an email, um, I may be able to teach this live again. As I mentioned, I'm going to be in Ocean City this weekend addressing a two-day conference on uh, surviving the stop. And, um, and we go to a lot of conferences. I'll be speaking at Lifesavers as well. So if anybody goes to Lifesavers, uh, I'll be presenting this and a lot more data uh, at Lifesavers. Uh, looks like we have one more question. Uh, do you believe the below 100 training has helped to reduce LE related fatalities and injuries? I absolutely do. And, um, you know, we, we partner with below 100 on a number of levels, and I think we might hopefully be doing some more work with them in the future. Um, we know their trainers, we absolutely believe in their message. And, uh, so to answer that question, it's a simple, yes, yes, they've saved lives and below 100 should be training regularly. And if we can get uh, I think particularly our younger officers to heed some of these 
Um, we can reduce crashes and save a lot of lives, but of course it extends across the board because we all get complacent behind a wheel. Uh, and again, anybody has any comments or concerns, um, please share them with me. The last thing I'll say, we always like getting interesting guest presenters. Um, we've had a couple of good ones on this year. I think Peter Simbal from Chesterfield, Virginia, really did a great presentation because we got a lot of feedback on that. And people really thought what he was doing down there in Virginia was, was very proactive and uh, forward thinking. And I think they were really interested in that. Um, and then even the blocking program from the chief fire chief in Irving, you know, this is all about public safety and saving lives. Anybody who has a good message about that, uh, we're always interested in listening. And I would expect us all to be hearing about some new safety measures that people are experimenting with on the highways, not only with just lightings and beacons, but I think helmets are coming. <laughs> so uh, for roadside safety, I think you're going to see more and hear more talks about helmets. Rio, I want to thank you for joining us today. And uh, um, I'll leave you all with that. And again, thank you for joining us. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Lifeline. Remember, OSW offers free resources to a wide variety of areas in law enforcement. Check out the episode description for links to those resources. Be sure to check back with us in the spring for the NHTSA first quarter review of 2024. Please subscribe to Precinct 444 on your favorite podcasting platform to stay connected and to receive our latest content as soon as it drops. We would love to hear from you. Send in your questions, comments, and feedback to precinct444 at nleomf.org. You can help us make our content even better. The National Law Enforcement Museum is located at 444 East Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., and is dedicated to telling the story of American law enforcement. We expand and enrich the relationship between law enforcement and the community through educational journeys, immersive exhibitions, and insightful programs. Find us online at lawenforcementmuseum.org and stay tuned for more podcast content from Precinct 444. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you at the precinct. Thank you.